This episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks is brought to you by Gigabyte's AMD X570 ARS motherboards for third generation AMD Ryzen 3000 processors. Hit the link in the description below for more details. In this episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks, we'll have Gigabyte's Rock and Radeons, AMD's Epic Winds, a Shark Tooth Beast, and a Sweet Little Dragonfly. Next. Welcome back to yet another episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks. Oh my goodness, it has been a week so far, and it's only Wednesday. I'm Dave Altavilla. How you folks doing out there in YouTube land? With me, as always, my brothers, Marco Cipetta and Chris Getting. Chris, who is behind the curtain. There's Chris. Hey, Chris. <laughs> and Marco. Double Marco now. Twin <laughs> Marcos. Nice. I like that. I like that. How you doing there, Marco, over in uh, Connecticut land this evening? As you're, uh, I heard you had some uh, ghosts in the machine earlier. I do. So regular viewers of the podcast uh, have probably heard me complain uh, about my system for probably about a year and a half. It's been making funky noises. Sounded like there were some crickets in it for a little while there. I think there were some coils going. Um, and I have been planning to build myself a new rig for literally months. I've had the hardware stacked up for months. And... Um, the last last night or two nights ago, my system shut down on its own. And since last night, I've had three shutdowns and one almost not come back up in. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I am rapidly building my new system and I'm trying to do it on video because I want to show everybody because I have some weird hardware choices. And I know everybody's going to be scratching their head when they see this build, but it's going to kick ass. And hopefully we can show it to you tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow. I got to get, get, get off this rig if I make it through the podcast. Wow, wow. So tomorrow we could have a rig build by yours truly, Marco. If yours truly, Dave, feels like editing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got I've got some stuff to edit tonight. Um, if I can grind through that, then yeah, I don't see why not. We'll uh we'll do the best we can. And uh either way, I'm glad you've got some new tools coming up because the almost didn't come up boot always sucks. I, always. I literally before the podcast like my routine is to just restart everything to make sure everything's clean and restart my router and my cable modem and restart my system, make sure everything's nice. And uh, I got that lovely five long beeps on uh, on that reboot. But luckily I shut down, brought it back up and it, it, it booted Windows. So, and here we are. And how long have you had this system for again? I, I don't remember the year, but this is literally the longest I've ever had a system without reformatting and installing Windows. I, this is an Ivy Bridge rig that I built before Windows 8 came out. I was so, going to say, isn't that like um, Windows, um, what was it, Vista? <laughs> no, it was 7 before 8. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow, Chris, you get any Windows Vista machines over there? Um. I don't think I have any kicking around anymore. I've got uh, one or two XP <laughs> laptops stuffed on a shelf somewhere, but uh, not in active use, thankfully. So you're not you're not running the uh, you're not running the stream on any of those like gerbils on a treadmill. I hope. Uh, not not quite. No. <laughs> I have a Windows Vista retail package on the shelf right next to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Microsoft's much maligned operating system of yesteryear. What a piece of crap that was. Holy God. Man. Yeah. Well, anyways, hey, let's stop it, whining. It got better. Well, it, it did. It got better. Yeah, when they, when they converted but... it to XP, it got better. <laughs> yeah. yeah, when it wasn't Vista anymore. <laughs> uh, well, let's stop whining. It's, it's hump day. Happy hump day. We, we try and get here on Wednesdays at 5.30 now, our new time slot. And you might notice some, some new production soit de vivre going on here by, uh, by the illustrious Chris Getting, who is producing our show now. Uh, we're still on the guys from Queen's Network, where you can find us syndicated. But certainly here at uh, YouTube.com, where we'd like you to thumb up and subscribe so we can notify you when we start the... Uh, the stream. So let's uh, let's get to the streaming and the talking about some some new technologies that are uh, on the bench and that are coming down the pipe. Lots of stuff still going on. We're starting to get that uh, gearing up for Q4. You know, holiday mad rush to CES kind of vibe going on already, and it's not even the end of September yet. But let's talk about uh, Gigabyte's Radeon RX 5700 XT Gaming OC 
My God, can you add some more descriptors to that graphics card? Uh, a custom-powered uh, uh, Navi GPU. There you can see TriFan Jammy. What do you know about this thing, Marco? I know you put it through its bases. I know lots, and I really like the cards. So, yeah, the uh, the custom Radeon RX 5700 series cards are flowing in. Um, previously, we took a look at a power color card. This is the second custom uh, 5700 XT that we're looking at. And uh, Gigabyte did a, a really nice job with this card. They're, they're, they sort of went for a more balanced approach than some of the others. So if you... Remember the the original 5700 XT launch, you know, AMD sort of introduced a, a, a new clock mode. So instead of just base and, and max boost clock, there's also game clock. And the typical frequency of the cards will usually hover somewhere between the game clock and the boost clock, depending on the application, yada, yada, yada. So what Gigabyte did with this card is they increase, so out of the box... It's a, it's a custom GPU across the board, custom PCB, custom cooler, um, and the clocks have been tweaked. So the base clock and the game clock are higher than AMD's reference cards. So you have a base clock of 1650 megahertz and a game clock of 1795 megahertz. The boost clock, however, is the same as a reference 5700 XT, so 1905 megahertz. Now, what that means is if you're not really getting, if the card's not getting hammered and it's able to hit that max boost, this card's not going to be really any faster than a reference card. But if it's a heavier workload and it's not able to achieve max boost and it's closer to the, the game clock, then this one might clock higher. But where Gigabyte has a big advantage over the reference card is with this cooler. So it is half a slot wider. So even though, you know, it's it's two and a half slot card, so really three slots. But what that gets you is this triple fan cooler. And what Gigabyte does really intelligently is the fans rotate um, in, you know, alternate directions. So that there's really no turbulence. The, the fans complement each other instead of causing turbulence between the blades. And with that large heat sink you end up with a, a much cooler running GPU that's way quieter than the blower cooler on the AMD reference card. And it also has, you know, RGB lighting and all that kind of kind of good stuff. So across the board, it's really an upgrade over AMD's reference card for only a little bit more money. So 419 MSRP versus 399 on AMD's card. Hmm. Okay, so a few more pesos, a lot more performance uh, in in certain conditions, and uh, what are acoustics like with all those fans of blowing? See, the acoustics are really good. Um, I don't remember the exact temperatures where the fans shut off. But when you're idling or tooling around the desktop, but if you're not gaming, the fans are off, so it's dead silent. Mm. And when you're gaming, they they do spin up, but under Regular benchmarking, not tweaking for overclocking, just regular use. Typical benchmark routine takes like four to five hours. So really not shutting off and being tested for hours. You you can't hear it if you install it in a case. You'll hear this the slightest whir of fan spinning up. So definitely a quiet card. Now, I, I did boost the fan speeds for overclocking, and you can make the card loud if you want to. But under normal circumstances, the, the card's very quiet all the time. Nice, nice. Is it? Would you say is it? Is it better for the average Jane or Joe to uh, to pick up a custom uh, Navi card rather than a reference design uh, GPU? And I'm not sure. I'm not sure how AMD's been doing with supply on the on the standard reference design. But um, what, what's your what's your gut sense in general in terms of value versus you know AMD's standard reference design? Um, personal opinion: there is zero reason to buy the reference card if you can sacrifice that extra half a slot. It, mm. It's literally an upgrade across the board for only slightly more money. Yes, it's more money, 20, 20 bucks. So, you know, what is that, 5%? Yeah, that's technically significant, but I would absolutely save an extra 20 bucks and get this card versus the reference card. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that makes sense to me, too. You know, now let's get a little bit more controversial here and talk about the subject of other gpus in its price range namely geforce rtx 2060 super uh you know 2070 um we're talking about a 400 dollars graphics card now roughly um what what is your thought versus uh competitive solutions out there from nvidia at this price point 
See, it, it, this is funny. It, it actually got more complicated recently too with um, right. the vari variable rate shading. So, like, at, at 3D Mark came out with their benchmark to show the benefits of variable rate shading, and uh, if you if you recall, AMD even Navi doesn't have the hardware to do uh, that particular type of variable rate shading that Nvidia and Intel can do, and that uh, UL put into the 3D Mark benchmark. Mm -hmm. So now you have you have this brand new. GPU architecture that that can't do uh, hardware accelerator ray tracing like NVIDIA, it can't do variable rate shading. Like there's lots of these little things cropping up, but or what AMD does well, you know, you have features like the anti-lag and radon image sharpening that work across a, a wide range of games and don't require developer support. And in terms of performance versus NVIDIA, you know, strictly talking performance in, you know, a, a, the group of games that we test with, let's say, um, 5700 XT is way, way more often than not faster than 2060 Super, sometimes hangs with the 2070 Super, it's typically right in line with like a, the original 2070. Yeah. So this is a fast GPU. This is, a, it's not the absolute top of the line, like, a, you know, a 2080 Super or 2080 Ti, but we're talking a very fast GPU for right around 400 bucks with features that can technically benefit a really wide range of games, but it lacks some of the features that NVIDIA and, and Intel's next-gen GPU will offer. So there's caveats. You know, yeah. I, I don't think there's and I don't think there's anybody that with a straight face can just recommend one GPU for everybody. You know, yeah. it's not easy. Yeah, I, I, you make a good point there um, with respect to the to the features that um, Intel, NVIDIA, and frankly Microsoft have built in. To uh, to to the API to the DX12 moving forward, you know whether it be ray tracing with DXR uh, or um, variable rate shading, um, that these are features that will be supported. So it's not like they're cost, you know, even semi custom, you know, non standard features that you need a, you know, a, a developer to. I mean, developers do for variable rate shading, they do need to take advantage of it, but it's going to be a standardized API uh, moving forward as will ray tracing, you know, moving forward. So, you know, there's that caveat that it's not just, you know, hey, a, a bell or a whistle that NVIDIA conjured up, you know, let's say, but a, but a mainstream standard uh, feature. And so, yeah, the, the question is, you know, how soon are they going to make a serious impact in games when you can get this performance out of the box now? With some pretty cool features like radio and image sharpening as well, and I've seen I've seen a lot of A/B comparisons with respect to image quality. What's your feeling with respect to image quality uh, comparisons that we're seeing now? Radio and image sharpening um, versus um, you know some of the things Nvidia does with um, I'm blanking on it right now. On DLSS. The DLSS. Thank you. Um, deep learning super sampling. They're kind of an A apples and oranges kind of thing. But, I mean, from what I've seen, it seems like AMD has a hand up in general with respect to image fidelity with these sort of, you know, freebie enhancements, quasi freebie. Anyways. Yeah, like if, if, if there was truly a way to do just like a direct apples to apples at the exact same resolution um, with the exact same features, I, I'd probably lean towards AMD. But on the NVIDIA side, you typically would have to enable ray tracing to get DLSS. And the ray tracing does offer some really cool effects yeah. in terms of realism as well. So yeah, like like as as I mentioned, I hate to, you know, to waffle, but it's it's really tough to pick. You know, and NVIDIA, it's first this is first gen ray tracing. This is AMD's first Navi, first GPU with a brand new architecture. You know, uh, there's always going to be growing pains and caveats like this. Um, they're they're both really great cards. If you're running something a few generations old, they're huge upgrades over you know something just even a, a few years old. So I, I like them both. Which one is for you? Really, is going to depend on what games you play and what features you want and what resolutions and budget. Yada yada yada. Yeah, yeah. It's like pick your pick your flavor. Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, gamers have a, uh, specific, uh, slant towards team green or team red, pick your flavor and run with it. You probably can't go wrong. Incidentally, by the way, um, NVIDIA also just to give some, uh, uh, uh balanced airtime here, NVIDIA also announced, uh, a gaming bundle today with, uh, GeForce RTX cards, call of duty bundled in 
for free with GeForce RTX cards, Call of Duty supporting Call of Duty Modern Warfare, the, the reboot, uh, supporting ray tracing now um, out of the box. So so good stuff there. Lots of really good options is the moral to the story, I think, right? Lots of really good options in the wind for uh, gamers these days. Yeah, so the, the one rule that I will say that's typically going to be true all the time, just buy the newest fastest gpu you can afford that day mm. and that'll that will be the card that serves you the best yep that is uh, always good advice belly <laughs> on up <laughs> open up that wallet and uh if you're gonna go for it go for it That's don't it. hesitate because you can sit on the sidelines forever all right let's let's move on to something else uh amd related uh they are making some headlines today uh, no question about it. Uh, AMD's second-gen Epic scores design wins in Dell EMC PowerEdge servers. Faster 64-core beast CPU unveiled as well. So, we'll, and we'll, we'll shift gears to the consumer side of it, but let's talk about uh, AMD's technology in the data center, which, as we know, Zen 2 and Ryzen 3000 on the desktop is certainly a powerful solution. But when you talk about the scalability of AMD's um, Zen 2 architecture, uh, it's also hugely powerful in the data center. And these days, actually trumping Intel in terms of core density per socket. And they now have up to a 64-core uh, uh, Epic CPUs available. Um, Dell EMC stepped out with an announcement that they are incorporating them in a, a line of five different Power Edge server configurations. These are their bread and butter um, cloud server uh, type offerings for you know big iron data centers. Whether you talk about Amazon AWS or you know Azure or any of these guys, you you would see these in uh, hosted cloud environments, and uh, it is a powerful, powerful story. It it there was a time when you know we knew AMD's uh, Zen architecture was going to make an, uh, a dent in uh, Intel's market share in the data center. And that, however, was it, it's a longer gestation period. The, the ramp up in, in, in the enterprise to adopt new architectures, completely new architectures in this case, with AMD Zen and then Zen 2, is much longer than the average desktop <clears throat> migration period in the market. It's it's real easy for consumers to shift gears to something new, not so much in the data center when mission critical infrastructure depends on it. And so <clears throat> this marks really um, a momentum uh, milestone for AMD and the fact that they've not only got HP firing, uh, they've got Lenovo firing for servers, they've now got Dell firing for servers. They've had multiple announcements, whether it be uh, AWS and, and Azure. Um, also, um, I believe there were some hints out there, if not formally announced, Google Cloud as well. They're really starting to get some traction. And it's because of this high density, <clears throat> you know, in a single socket, 64 cores, and you can scale to two socket servers as well, of course, and, and larger. Um, but when you talk about what, what Intel has available to compete, sure, you've got a, I think it's a 56-core Xeon uh, Platinum scalable out these days. But when you, when you look at price, per, uh, performance per dollar type comparisons, it's way slanted in favor of AMD. <clears throat> the, the average 28-core Intel Xeon chip retailing for around anywhere from like ten to $18,000, depending on your config. Meanwhile, a 64-core Zen 2 server chip, Epic server chip from AMD, $6,950. That's, that's 64 cores versus 28 cores in that case, although you can scale up to 56 cores in a single chip. And Intel these days, I don't even want to think about what pricing is going to be on that. What do you think about this, Marco? I mean, it's talk about some powerful, powerful stuff. The average you know, IT manager, you know, data center infrastructure guy or girl is going to be like, wow, I'm, you know, salivating at that. But it's not so easy to just say, hey, bring it in, plug it in and let's let's go. You got to qualify these things. It takes a while, right? Yeah, exactly. But I, I think, you know, with with the first gen Epic um, 
the market was sort of clamoring for uh, something to as an alternative to an Intel, but weren't ready to just fully embrace it and jump on board. Um, the second gen Epic, the, these things are just monsters, and they offer so many benefits. You know, from from the the value, as you mentioned, price to performance ratio to features like PCIe Gen four, and yeah. you can have you know a more affordable. I don't want to say mainstream, but a, a single socket server with 64 cores that you know beats an Intel 2P with two 28 core CPUs in there that costs like three, four times more. So there's some huge benefits. You know, AMD is being really aggressive about this platform. You know, they could, in theory, charge a heck of a lot more if they wanted to for what these things are offering. But they are being aggressive and they they want to gain share with this generation and. They seem to have the tech, and now they have all the partners. And you know, with Dell, Dell sells a ton of servers. Yeah. So now that you have, you know, uh, Dell PowerEdge servers with these chips in there too, man, it's it's a lot of good news for AMD. Yeah, 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 and it, it really does mark a, just another level of adoption for that that Zen architecture and Zen two in this case. I mean, it's just it's impressive stuff, and you have to you have to hand it to AMD. Kudos for them to come from. You know, the frankly, years ago, not too long ago, just a few short years ago, the brink of ex- extinction, right? <laughs> I mean, we we have to remember those days. They were very close on the balance sheet to not being around anymore. And and then, uh, you know, Dr. Lisa Sue stepped in with uh, with a new team, and there was a new design architecture put in motion. Uh, and now we are challenging Intel, seriously challenging Intel, um, right at their beachhead which is, you know, bread and butter, high margin server business, impressive stuff. Uh, and we'll shift gears to something else that's impressive that we saw a leak on today that uh, ought, to, ought to turn some eyeballs in the consumer mainstream or maybe not mainstream, but enthusiast uh, uh, desktop space. And that's AMD's Threadripper 3000 Shark Tooth 32 core CPUs show dominant performance in new benchmark leak. And so, just like uh, with with Zen two, um, we we saw a you know a, a revamp of of the uh, of the product line. Zen two is now going to. We've been told that there will be a Zen two uh, or Threadripper version of uh, at, you know built on Zen two technology, and we're just now starting to see some some leaks and. Um, you know, uh, rumors in the in the winds here that are suggesting perhaps it's getting much closer to reality and hitting the market. And in this case, you're looking at um, that's actually a beautiful little die shot, but it's uh, glitz and glam. If you if you scroll down the page a little bit, Chris, there's um, actually a, a Geekbench five score, uh, twenty three thousand and fifteen multi core score, twelve hundred and seventy five single core score. Scrolling down a little bit more, if we compare that to the previous gen, there's a little AB right there that shows <clears throat> the 2990WX Threadripper. Um, again, 32 core to 32 core. Um, do I have that right? No, hang on yeah. a second. 32 yeah, 32 core, 32 core to 32 yeah. core. Yeah, I was, I was, I was thinking about 16 core Threadrippers too. There's so many variables now. It's, it's tough. But anyways, 2990WX versus the uh, the shark's tooth. We don't have a model number um, from AMD that supposedly leaked out. Now we have to take this with a grain of salt. It is a leak. They're showing a 3.59 gigahertz boost, I think, um, versus a three gigahertz boost. I don't know. That seems a little, little up there, maybe. Um, but this is theoretically Zen two thread thread rip at 32 cores, and it is just annihilating by about. Uh, 10,000 Geekbench points or so to be exact in the multi-thread score and a significant boost, uh, you know, if you did the math, something like a uh, uh, 20% boost in single core throughput, uh, maybe 18-ish. Um, what do you think about this leak, Marco? Cool stuff, huh? If it's Yeah, real. <laughs> so it, th- th- there's lots of fake Geekbench uh, results out there, yeah. but what this one, I, I, I have a feeling it might be legit. Now, that single thread score sort of makes sense you know 20 percent because there's going there there's the ipc uplift yeah. probably going to be some clock benefits Latency. now the multi-thread score 
might have people bugging out going, wow, how can the multi-thread score 32 core versus 32 core be such a difference? Now, the difference is in how Geekbench handles memory because the 2990 WX only has memory attached to, to two of its four die. Right. So if a workload bounces from one of the, the dies that don't have memory attached to a die that does, the AMD calls them compute dies, um, you have you know lots of weirdness with latency and how the workload is handled, and, and Geekbench basically barfs. So if you went back to our 2990WX review, I tested the, the 2990WX um, with all 32 cores enabled and then in, in game mode, which basically, you know, uh, parks half of the cores and the Geekbench multi-thread score hardly changes. So only like half of this CPU gets utilized in Geekbench. Mm. That's why you see that huge gain in multi-thread. That said, Zen 2 and, and the IO die and the way AMD has configured the, the Ryzen 3000 and presumably the next gen thread rippers will help with uh, multi thread workloads as well. So, obviously, really looking forward to next gen thread ripper, no matter what that benchmark says. Yeah. Yeah. It's an exciting uh, chip to ponder when you think about the, um, the improvements to the Zen 2 architecture and what it means for a many core chip like it. Uh, the reductions in latency, the fatter cache, all of that stuff just plays well for a many core chip. Um, I just dropped a link into the chat for your 2990 WX review. Um, one caveat to note in that review, you can't compare the Geekbench scores in that review to what you're seeing in this article uh, for the leak, for the Sharks 2 leak, leak, excuse me, because uh, that was Geekbench 4. That's what we used to test. Looks like they used Geekbench 5, maybe a a pre-release version, I think, an early version of Geekbench 5, probably so that they ensured that it understood the architecture as best as it could. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, it's an interesting, I mean, leaks are always fun, right? You got to just kind of look at them as fun and, uh, you know, take them with a grain of salt because, you know, may or may not be, uh, if, you know, it's, it could be fact, could be fiction, but um, I don't know. This kind of has a, a, a pretty good whiff of, of reality going on here and um you know you're just looking at um you know just some of the specs with it i guess they could have been you know faked in there or something photoshopped in but um yeah it's uh it's it's looking impressive um man talk about a kick butt system that thing would be right yeah so um the system that i'm <laughs> building is a 2990 wx um uh -huh. Oh. And I, I know people are going to be like, why don't you wait? Why don't you wait? Because my system that I'm on now is going to explode. That's why I'm <laughs> not going to wait. But right. um, yeah, so I, I have a feeling that the next gen thread rippers are going to be freaking awesome. Um, I, I really, I can't wait. I, I, it'll, we'll probably know more uh, late next month. We'll see. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we still have the 3950X coming. So the 16 core. Right for the mainstream platform should be coming end of this month. So I'm Damn hoping we it. hear something soon. And then, uh, yeah. And then we start hearing about next gen thread rippers, I hope. Yeah. Yeah. And, and actually depending on bios and all that support and all that good stuff, your motherboard that you're using now should be socket compatible to next gen thread ripper. I'm, you know, I'm not sure next what's happening there. I, I've mm. I'm, I'm hearing rumblings about oh, yeah? stuff. Mm. So yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens there. Mm, okay can't i don't want i don't want to i don't want to say anything just yet <laughs> uh, i'm not sure how it's going to play out you could tell you you could tell us but you'd have to shoot us and we'd rather you not do that appreciate it <laughs> always looking out for us thanks marco yeah. all right let's uh let's let's move on to uh something cool and uh sleek from hp a couple of things cool and sleek from hp and we'll just touch upon uh the first one quickly because there's a deep dive review on it hot hardware that you should you should be reading, of course. Um, but HP's ZBook 14U G6, uh, a thin, powerful mobile workstation. Uh, we had our good buddy, uh, Ben, check this baby out. Um, ben Funk, love that name. Great guy, too. Um, uh, reviewer extraordinaire at Uh Yeah, what, what do you know about this, Marco? It's... Uh, it's you know it's it's from HP's uh, ZBook line, which is um, commercial, you know, sort of uh, workhorse kind of product. Um, a little bit more pedestrian looking, lack of better words. 
What do you think? Yeah, so I, I like the more pedestrian looking because you know you can take them anywhere. But this is the, so the, the the specific machine that Ben looked at was the HP ZBook 14U G6. Now, when this machine was announced, uh, HP billed it as uh, I believe they called it the thinnest mobile workstation on the market. So there are thinner machines out there, but this guy is pretty cool. So it's got a, a Core i7 8665U. But it's paired to an AMD Radeon Pro WX3200 discrete GPU with uh, you know four gigs of dedicated GDDR5 memory, and then obviously you have all you know all the other good stuff in there too, up to 32 gigs of DDR4 RAM, uh, Samsung NVMe SSD, really high end, nice 4K display in a 14 inch notebook. And it's a you know an IPS display that's calibrated nicely with an anti glare coating and up to 400 nits of brightness. So you know a, a really nice high end display. That like like I said, this is a what HP is building a mobile workstation. So it's for you know creative professionals, those that might be working with imagery, things like that. Mm. And you know basically no compromises on features uh, on features. I want to say or performance, but there is. A couple of caveats with performance. So, you know, you have uh, high end 802.11 AC Wi Fi, uh, Intel Gigabit uh, wired uh, Ethernet as well, Bang and Olufsen audio. A, it is an understated chassis. It's a mobile workstation. It's not a gaming machine, but I think a good looking chassis. You know, nice finishes all around, nothing gaudy, nothing over the top either. <clears throat> but you know just a clean machine all around backlit keyboard you do have you know a little security feature over the webcams you don't got to be sticking tape over the webcam if you're paranoid about that kind of stuff mm. and if you look through the benchmarks so th this is one of the confusing things when you buy a notebook right you can have two notebooks with the same uh core i7 8665u but one company might strictly adhere to the 15 watt tdp and another company might do what's called use the TDP up configuration, where you know some companies, if the cooler is uh, is capable, will allow the chip to boost to higher clocks and use more power, and hence get more performance. Now, right. because this G this system has a dedicated discrete workstation class GPU in it, HP chose to not use the TDP up. So this is strictly 15 watt Core i7 configuration because the cooler is cooling that GPU and the CPU at the same time. So if you look at a workload like Cinebench, uh, this machine actually loses versus similarly configured or what would appear to be similarly configured, say Lenovo X1 Carbon. Um, but on a more bursty workload where that TDP isn't being taxed you know, under a sustained workload, it's it's just as fast, and then you also have the system is super speedy anyway with that SSD and all of that memory. But what Ben fa finds, and this is something that you also won't find on some notebooks that use the TDP up configuration, is under sustained load for you know long times for the CPU and the GPU getting hit. It there's minimal throttling on this machine, mm -hmm. so some machines you see performance tank because the cooler can't keep up. This particular machine. It, 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 I think performance dropped a couple percentage points, which is expected, but it did not tank. It's consistent performance across the board. So, you know, overall, a, a what I'd like to call an elegant mobile workstation from HP with lots of nice features. And, and I personally, I like the aesthetics. I like that understated look. And this particular machine we looked at, I believe with the configuration that Ben looked at, pricing was about 2200 bucks, but they start at like 1399 for, for this particular machine. Um, you know, if, if you need a mobile workstation and you want something small closer to an Ultrabook, it might be worth checking out. Yeah, and, and I think the other thing to underscore there is it's uh, it's got uh, an AMD Radeon Pro WX3200 on board, so if you need that kind of um, ProVis app certification, um, four gigs of GDDR5 memory to go with it, um, <clears throat> and up to 32 gigs of RAM. So it's it can be decked out with some pretty stout configurations. A um, little disappointed on the battery life, and I think that's a combination of 4K display plus a uh, 3,230 milliamp hour battery, which seems a little thin for a 14-inch uh, machine. Um, <clears throat> usually we see something in the neighborhood of 45 to 55 uh, excuse me. Yeah. 30, I'm sorry. It's a 50 watt hour battery. 
Um, we usually see something in the neighborhood of 55 or so watt hours in this size of machine or, or larger. I think you're starting to see, even see Lenovo ThinkPads with like 60. Um, so what happens is on battery life with a 4k display, you're, you know, you can see in our graph, it's down in the, uh, the bottom half, but <clears throat> if you, if you went for the 1080p option, you're going to see a lot more battery life out of it because uh, you're not lighting up as many as many pixels. So uh, that 4K display, if you need it, got to have it. You can't, you know, there's no substitute for screen real estate and resolution. Um, but if you don't need it, you know, think about the other options there because uh, certainly could conserve some battery life, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Though I, I mean, I, I to look at the chart, you see the machine kind of in the middle of you know of the battery life chart, but. Yeah. It kind of it was right there with the the 2019 uh, Dell XPS 13, which doesn't have a discrete GPU. So, you know, it's 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 good battery life, not great battery life, but it's not bad either. Um, yeah. And and one other caveat that Ben found with this machine. Now, I have I've tested these Pro GPUs standalone before, and y you can game on them fine. Some for some reason the way HP has got the software and drivers configured. Uh, a couple of the games and 3D benchmarks did not run on the discrete GPU. They ran on the Intel GPU. Hmm. And that didn't really make sense to me, um, but there was no solid answer. So there might be some, uh, you know, some driver quirks there that I will probably get worked out. But uh, as it stands now, we wouldn't recommend this guy if you want it to do some gaming also, because then, it, you know, you might as well just, get something with a better more powerful gpu in it where the gpu is going to work all the time yeah. but um you know if you if you're going to do some of the pro viz stuff and you want that you know that software certification that comes with the radeon pro then this guy is an option cool all right let's let's move on to something new uh okay. br brandy new that, yeah uh, that isn't even fully out yet in the wild although you saw it in the wild in new york recently and that's the hp elite dragonfly also from the makers at HP. Um, this is uh, from their Elite book series, but they're calling it just the Elite Dragonfly, just to confuse us instead of an Elite book. It's an Elite, and it even says Elite book <laughs> on the palm rest. Exactly. <laughs> but they're calling it just the Elite Dragonfly. <clears throat> and uh, also a 14-inch machine, right? Uh, what's, what's this bad boy all about? It uh, looks light as a feather or a dragonfly, as the case may be. Yeah, this is not so. Um, it, it was announced uh, really today, two o'clock in the morning was when the embargo lifted. But I saw it a couple of days ago. We have hands-on video on the site and on the YouTube channel. We have pics and we have, you know, all of the uh, all the specs here. But yeah, this is a this is a really beautiful uh, professional notebook. So HP's Elite Book line are their, you know, their enterprise notebooks. This is what, a, you know, a business would buy a fleet of these guys. And they're known for being, you know, serviceable and and more rigid and just, you know, high quality machines all around, maybe not quite as premium as, you know, some of the crazy consumer class premium ultra books, but really nice machines. And now this, the Elite Dragonfly, HP's done a lot of nice stuff with this. So you have multiple screen options, including up to a, a 1,000 uh, nit, I believe it was a, it's a 4K, there's a 4K UHD that's 550 nit, a basic uh, one watt full HD, only one watt full HD display. And then there's a, um, let me just, I, I don't see the spec in front of me, but there is a 1000 nit uh, 4K screen option that looks just freaking gorgeous. There's also multiple battery options and there, there's the mainstream battery that comes with it's going to offer, I don't, I don't think they disclosed the battery life, it was something... I want to say 12 to 13 hours, but there's a, a larger battery option that will be over 24 hours of battery life on the machine. And now it's this machine is actually a part of Project Athena, but it's using eighth gen processors with V Pro. So hmm. for the V Pro processors, it's not 10th gen 10 nanometer stuff. It's still the the eighth gen stuff. But so you basically get Intel's latest you know line of processors with V Pro. Um, and all of the latest accoutrements you want in a machine, uh, 802.11ax, um, NVMe storage, it's user serviceable, large battery, pen support, touch support, backlit keyboard. And uh, one thing I did find funny at the launch is that HP was touting their uh, their new rubber dome technology for the keyboard <laughs> uh, to have a, you know good uh, a nice feeling keyboard with such a shallow throw, but. I, I personally, if I was a marketing guy, I wouldn't have used the term rubber dome to uh, 
on a machine dubbed Elite. But yeah, so all around really beautiful 14 inch, uh, you know, professional notebook that looks like more of a stylish consumer ultrabook. Yeah, man, I am. I'm kind of excited for this machine. Um, tell me, did you see an SD card slot in that puppy anywhere? I don't remember. I sent Brandon Mike, pictures micro of both SD? sides. So there, see, there's the cool thing is there's full size ports right on both sides. So you're not mm. going to be worrying about dongles. I don't remember if there was a card reader. I'm not sure. I'd have to go look at the pics. I don't have them in front of me. Yeah, I'm gonna. Um, I'm going to start looking around. I, I'm, I'm seeing a nice assortment of USB-C. Uh, yeah, it looks like what might be a micro SD card slot on, on, on the, uh, the right side, I think. Um, hard to tell. So there's also an LTE option, so that might be for a SIM card. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, that's, that's the other thing that, that struck me with this thing. It's got, it's got all the latest and greatest, right? So you've got your Wi-Fi 6 on board for the, for, you know, the wireless radio, um, but you've also got uh, LTE capability, which is, which is great. So you get the, the best of both worlds there. Um, support for Optane memory, um, as well as you know, standard PCI Express SSDs. Um, love the thin uh, three-sided bezel on that puppy. Um, it looks like the, the camera's certainly up top. I wonder if it's Windows Hello capable. Probably is. It, it is. Yeah, yep. yeah. And then and then 4K um, Ultra HD at a thousand nits. You're right, and even at uh, up to a thousand nits. Uh, I imagine. Uh, let me see. Brightness rating while well, the second bumps that up to even to even a thousand nits. Yeah, well, no, that's I'm sorry. The FHD, the, I think the 4K UHD tops out at 550 nits. At any rate, are we, we got to be talking HDR panels in here somewhere too, right? HDR so capable. Th th there, there's three panels. There's a, a, a one watt 1080p full HD the base panel. Yeah. There's the 550 nit um, HDR panel, and then mm. there's the top end 1000 nit 4K panel. Right, right, right. Now, right and and right. one thing also to mention that battery life quote. That 24 hours of battery life is with the one watt full HD panel. Obviously, it's the lowest power screen is going to get you the best battery life. One, one, one watt. So you're saying it consumes one watt active. Only one light. watt. Yeah. 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 And and that's what um, also struck me. Does the 2.2 pound number still, I don't know if you know this, but they talk about an integrated long life 56 watt hour battery. Right. For, for a 2.2 pound machine, if that's the case, that's a nice size battery. And the 2.2 pounds with the smaller battery. Okay. He, they All didn't right. have the actual number when I was at the event. I'm not sure if it was in the release. It, it's only, it's only marginally heavier. Yeah, it's probably battery. like, not, yeah, it's probably like barely two and a half pounds at that point with the bigger battery, but whatever you're talking about, I'd love to take a look at the 56 watt hour battery machine. Cause that thing's probably got some great battery life. Um, yeah. Cool looking stuff, uh, from HP there. Nice to see them firing pen support as well. Um, really, what else do you need in the notebook? It's going to be interesting to find out what they price this puppy at. You know, and this, this is a, and this is a convertible too, so it's got the three sixty hinge design. Yep, um, it's it it it's really nice, man. It, it it was it was a nice machine, and it's got this really cool sort of I forget the name that they use for the iridescent blue color on it, but if you're sort of in the dark, it looks like a sleek black, and it, as soon as the light hits it, it's got this deep blue. It's, it's a really nice looking machine. Yeah, we'll have to check it out when it's uh, available for review. We'll be uh, harping on our friends at HP to send us one in ASAP. So stick around to Hot Hardware for that. We will be putting it through its paces. Um, one uh, device, then we'll shift gears now and finish off with uh, mobile handsets, smartphones, specifically of the Android Vintage, uh, that we are looking at right now is the Asus ROG Phone 2. Oh, there it is, blowing out your screen. Let me flip it around here. Yeah, there we go. That's a little better shot. Asus ROG Phone 2. This puppy is currently on the test bench. We actually did a little benchmark preview of it. And uh, it is powered by a Qualcomm Snapdragon 855 Plus processor, which is a goosed up Snapdragon 855. Currently the fastest Android SoC in the U.S. I will qualify that by saying some versions of Samsung's Exynos processors are pretty potent as well for um, handsets out in uh, Europe and Asia. But in the U.S., Snapdragon is uh, what's happening these days. And uh, the 855 Plus 
is an amped up version of the latest gen Snapdragon. And, and it actually, in this device, the Asus ROG Phone 2, really puts up some impressive numbers. We saw roughly a 10% advantage over the fastest thing we've ever seen in a Android benchmark. Uh, devices like the Samsung Galaxy Note 10 Plus, the Samsung Galaxy S10, uh, which have led our benchmark numbers recently, even OnePlus 7 Pro, um, which also is a very fast uh, device with uh, up to 12 gig of RAM. Uh, this Asus ROG Phone 2 is built for gamers, though, in mind, so it has up to 12 gig of RAM, that goosed up Snapdragon 855 Plus, 120 hertz OLED display. It is gorgeous, it is fast, and it's big. I think it's uh, 6.59 inches. And they don't make any bones about having. Okay, don't don't say it, Marco. I know you're thinking it, but don't say it. I didn't say anything. They don't make any bones about bezel either. There is a little bit of bezel on the top and bottom, and that's to make room for really what is what I feel the best, one of the best, probably the best I've ever heard in person, uh, sounding stereo speaker system in an Android phone. I think there's probably a few others that might compete that I haven't heard lately. Um, but this thing, you know, versus anything I've heard from Samsung, for example, just blows it out of the water uh, acoustically. And so <clears throat> really nice features for gamers. Also has a clip-on cooling fan if you want to do that. There's actually a pair of, um, I don't know if you can see it, but there's actually a pair of USB-C ports on the side where the fan clips in, you get control and lighting, RGB, of course. Uh, and um, the also the nice benefit about having that side USB-C port is, yeah, here's, here's the lighting on the back. We'll light it back up. Hang on. There we go, baby. Um, the, uh, the nice thing about being able to, um, to charge from the side is obviously if you're holding it in portrait mode, you're, you don't have to worry about if, you, if you're plugged in, you don't have to worry about that, uh, that cable sticking off the side, off the, off the bottom if you're in portrait mode trying to game like this. So you can be you know, maybe holding it down like this, the USB-C charging down the bottom, and you're, you're gaming like this. So <clears throat> it's a good setup, tons of accessories to go with it. Um, they've got a little game pad that gives you, uh, you know, joystick controller and you know, all kinds of different triggers and buttons. Um, so yeah, Paul Lilly's putting us through its paces. Check out the performance preview. Um, Impressive device to be sure. Big honking smartphone. Um, 6,000 milliamp hour battery. So I think battery life is going to be pretty darn good, even with a 120 hertz display. What are your thoughts on this bad boy, Marco? And then we'll close up shop here for the day. Seems pretty hardcore. I know the, the first gen uh, ROG phone, uh, Paul really liked it. And this one's got the, that more powerful SOC and more refined accessories there. Seems like a good looking phone. I'm, I'm looking forward to the review. Yeah, it's um, and it, there's a couple of configurations. Five twelve gigabyte of storage is the one I have. Paul actually, and that's the ROG Phone Elite, eight ninety nine, I believe. Um, so you know it's up there price wise, but not crazy compared to like a Galaxy Note ten plus. You know, and other very large format phones. Um, Especially with those features, man, with a hundred and twenty yeah. hertz OLED display, and you know the gaming features and. Uh, it's, and that processor. more powerful yeah. SOC, uh, yeah, man, that's you know that's pretty cool. It's it's respectable. It's it's pricey, but it's 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 competitive. It's price competitive. Certainly, when you when you talk about the features and performance you get for the dollar, and the one terabyte uh, ultimate edition is I want to say it's uh, eleven hundred and ninety nine dollars. It's twelve hundred bucks. That, that's not cheap either. But again, you get one terabyte on a phone of storage. If you're doing a lot of gaming. On your phone, uh, you know, that could come in handy and certainly for pictures and video. It's got a 48 megapixel uh, rear uh, camera, Sony IMX camera. That's pretty darn good as well from my initial uh, scope of that. Um, so stay tuned to Hot Hardware. We'll have the full review up on that and uh, the weeks ahead, probably days actually. And uh, yeah, you'll see what it's all about then. But check out the uh, benchmark preview in the meantime. Marco, tell the folks what we're going to give away here shortly. And then we'll uh, say au revoir for the evening. Yeah. So um, <laughs> we 
it's definitely happening. We're we're not sure exactly how the giveaway is going to work. We're going. We typically keep it super easy. Um, but Falcon Northwest is celebrating their 20th anniversary. They have a new Talon machine coming that we actually have in the review process now. I believe Chris is almost done with the review. And then it's also our 20th anniversary. So we decided let's give away one of these crazy high-end, beautiful, custom-built Falcon machines. Uh, actually, we really need to thank uh, Kelt Reeves from Falcon Northwest for uh, for offering it up. But yeah, so as soon as the, as we have all the details hammered, hammered out, we'll announce the specifics of the system. It will be a Ryzen 3000-based machine, most likely 3900X-based machine, with a uh, you know nice, beefy GPU in there. With that beautiful build quality and nice uh, case that we know uh, Falcon Northwest for. And they also have a, a new way to customize the cases with these cool paint jobs and graphics. Uh, that will be featured on it as well. And, uh, you know, once we have all of the details hammered out, we'll make the contest announcement. We'll usually keep it super easy. But uh, one of you can, can win it and you will get to game on this awesome machine soon enough. There you go. There you go. Free stuff, free awesome stuff coming your way. Stay tuned to hothardware.com where you can find us on the web, twitter.com slash hothardware, youtube.com slash hothardware vids or hot hardware. Uh, we're everywhere. Hit thumbs up and subscribe. We'd like to have you with us every week at 5.30 on Wednesdays. Hopefully, that's when we try and get to it. Uh, and yeah, until then, we thank you very much for stopping by.